bumble and rumble and tumble through this remodel situation. We done some work last week and got here over the weekend and <clears throat> none of the plugs on the up in the offices worked. That's why we got cords running on both sides this morning. That's not for decorations. We're not trying to set a new trend. But we're going to get that fixed up today. And when you get back next week, the Lord willing, something else will be tore out somewhere else. And it's going to be a long project because all, all I'm looking for is just Sunday evenings to work. So if you can come help us on Sundays from 2 to 5, I went too long last week. And I've, I've tried to break up more jobs this week and so we can get people spread out more and do more stuff from you can be back after lunch about 2 o'clock, and we'll start working hopefully from then till 5, and we'll try our best to shut it down at 5. And if you've got to go at 5, at five you go, and we'll try to get this done little bites at a time. <clears throat> so that's our, our hope and what we're looking at. So the good Lord willing, you'll come back next week, and something else will be tore up. Wise old sage, member of our church once told me, Pastor, if you just tear it up, you got to fix it. So I'm just right now tearing stuff up. So if you get here and something's tore up, well, we're going to have to fix it. So bear with us. We'll get it fixed one day. But hey amen. This morning, this evening, uh, if a lot of ladies, if you want to come, we're going to attempt, we're going to try to move the church office from here back to that room over yonder and then move some of that. Am I right, babe? And move some of that over to the parsonage. So some smaller jobs for... Any of the ladies that want to try to help out, we'd appreciate that. <clears throat> Amen. The Lord is good. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 8 and verse 23. I've not forgotten anything. Somebody open your Bible and tell me how many chapters there are in Proverbs, please. How many? That's our Bible reading for this week. I forgot that. Proverbs is our Bible reading this week. I forgot that. So now you know what we're going to try to read this week, the book of Proverbs. So take that, break it down, and that'll be our Bible reading. <clears throat> Amen. Remember our fasting? Amen. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. <clears throat> I'll be reading through verse... 27, and when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Jesus was asleep in the storm. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said to them, Why are you so fearful and of, of little and O ye of little faith, then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm, verse 27, finally. But the men marveled, the disciples marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Well, that's because he's more than just a man. <clears throat> Go to the uh, same, same story in Mark chapter 4, Mark 4, verse 37. Mark 4. Verse 37, I'll be reading through 41. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. <clears throat> and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great Calm, keep going for me through 41. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? See, fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is contagious, but so is faith. If somebody tells you you're going to die, if you're not careful, you'll believe them. If somebody tells you you're going to live, if, if you'll be alert, you can believe them. The reason we go to, for, to different doctors for a second opinion because we're not sure we believe them. The doctor tells you you're going to live. You call everybody and tell them, good news, I'm going to live. Amen. The preacher tells you, 
You're going to live and you don't tell nobody. Let's wait and see. Let me go on. And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Going over to Luke chapter 8, Luke 8, verse 23. Luke 8 and verse, you hear that water running this morning. We're going to baptize Mickey in Jesus' name today. Amen. Luke 8, verse 23 through 25. But as they sailed, he fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was great calm, or a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commanded even the winds and the water, and they obey him. That's good right there. Everything is under his power. Amen. You'll never meet a storm that Jesus don't control. That's why he doesn't want us to be afraid. Because Satan ain't in control of nothing. Anything Satan does to us is allowed by God. Does God allow Satan to do stuff? He sure does. Go look at the book of Job. God, God will allow Satan to do things for our refining and for his glory. Because Satan thinks you're not legit. He thinks, he's telling God they're not real. they only here because they want you to give them stuff. Stop giving them stuff and they'll backslide, Lord. And so you know what God does? He says, fine, I'll stop giving them stuff. And then you're the one who decides whether you're real or not. You're not going to live for God, Scott, and every day be great. There are going to be days you want to and days you don't want to. And the days you don't want to are just as important as the days you want to. The famed artist Rembrandt painted hundreds of scapes on canvas. But he only painted one seascape. He painted the renowned Christ in the storm on the Sea of Galilee in 1633. The painting depicted the panic-stricken disciples in their fishing boat trying to regain control of that vessel after being caught in a sudden fierce storm on the Sea of Galilee. A huge, vi huge violent waves were crashing over the bow of the boat and they and as they sailed, it was ripping as the boat apart, as the boat draws perilously close to some rocks on that painting. You can see the storm blowing the boat everywhere. Strangely, in his painting, he has 14 people on the boat. Now, if you can do math, and I can't, but Jesus plus 12 is how many? Man, you people are smart. He's got 14 people on the boat in his painting. The Lord Jesus, obviously, is one of them, and his 12 disciples are the other 12. And then the 14th individual, most likely many believe it's Rembrandt himself because he was renowned for painting himself into his own canvas. One of the disciples is shown leaning over the edge of the boat, apparently seasick from the storm and vomiting. It probably Judas Iscariot as he was the only non-Galilean of the 12 disciples among those 12 men who were probably accustomed. We know that Peter and Andrew and James and John were fishermen and they fished the Sea of Galilee so they probably knew every contour and every crevice of that body of water. But it's probably Judas leaned over. He wasn't used to being seasick and it probably got the best of him and He's not accustomed to sailing in a boat, and the Galileans were. But in that painting is Rembrandt. We have to put ourselves into the painting. Storms are going to come. A bad call is going to happen. A death's going to occur. Something's going to break. I I'm starting to believe more and more as I get older, everything they build is designed to break. It's going to break down. It's going to fall apart. Be it a machine or be it a relationship, everything tends to want to fall apart. 
And I'm of the opinion sin has a large contributing factor in that. Amen? Everything is eroding. Everything is falling apart. We're remodeling the building because it's just looking like it needs help. You know, if a house isn't lived, uh, lived in long enough, Brother Meeks, it'll just start falling down. Just of its own weight, it'll start collapsing. You have to put something into that house to keep it alive and keep it going. And so it is in our relationship with God. If we don't put something in, it'll just fall apart. It's got to be important enough for your time and your money, and your heart. And if your heart ain't in it, pretty soon your money and your time won't be in it either. And when you really get your heart into it, time and money will get involved. And I want to tell you today, your time and your money tell you where your heart is. It don't tell God where your heart is. He knows where your heart is. But it tells you where your heart is. The New Testament is rich in its use of Old Testament Scripture. Quoting phrases from the Old Testament happens over and over. That's why we use the Old Testament. Jesus used it. Or alluding, alluding to the Hebrew Scriptures approximately 800 times. Both Testaments are Christ-centered in the Old Testament. It points toward Jesus coming as the Messiah, and the New Testament declares He's here. Jesus said all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, the three categories of the Hebrew Bible, Jesus alluded to the law and the prophets and the Psalms. Same categories we have in our Old Testament. He alluded to those things as being pointing toward him that would be fulfilled in him. He is the spotless sacrifice. He is the tabernacle. He is the door. He is the good shepherd. He is everything that we need. He's also a provider. He's also the one who calms the storm. The New Testament writers quoted the book of Psalms more than any other book. 206 references to the book of Psalms punctuate the New Testament. The book of Psalms was the hymnal for the children of Israel, for the church of that day. They sung these things to the Lord about how great he was. Psalm 65 and 7 speaks of God which sitteth, which God stilleth, excuse me, God which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. God doesn't just still the waves. Pull up Psalm 65 and 7. I want them to see this. Psalm 65 verse 7. The whole chapter is good, but we'll pull this out. Psalm 65 and verse 7. God would still at the noise of the seas and the noise of their waves. Watch this, though. And the tumult of the people. He doesn't just steal the storm. Sometimes he steals you. God don't always take you out of the fire. Sometimes he just shows up in the fire with you. Because God knows the fire helps us sometimes. You know, some people ain't going to live for God without a fire in their life. They'll backslide and quit when everything's going fine. But you let all hell break loose in their life. They'll show up and try to live for God. And then they'll pray, Lord, save me. What they're asking for the Lord to do is, God, keep me in terrible situations. Because God knows the only way I can save you is to keep you in a mess. I want to I wanna mature beyond that in God. I want to live for God when the bank account's full and when the bank account's empty. When my body feels great, and when my health is leaving me, I don't want God have to send me into a storm to get my attention. But he will. And if God sends you into a mess to save you, he did you a great favor. Hello? He doesn't just steal the storms. He steals the people in the storm. As the disciples aboard that ill-fated boat marveled at the great calm, it was not hard for us to imagine them saying, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Psalm 6. It, it helps us to know that when the Antichrist rules this earth, and that's coming, they're trying to 
crash the dollar, it appears to me. And they're going to succeed. And when bad days come and when we're persecuted for his namesake, you go read Revelations, you'll find the souls under the altar in that fifth, uh, fifth seal. The souls under the altar, the saints who've been martyred. And here's what they said, Oh Lord, how long before you take care of those on the earth who martyred us and, and took away our lives? And you know what the Lord said? Just wait a little bit longer. I got some more of your fellow brethren that's got to be killed like you were killed. That's in your Bible. Wait a minute, God. You're going to let something bad happen to us? God is not in this for our temporal entertainment or our temporal everything's okay. God is okay with things going wrong in our lives. God is okay with getting us into a storm. Here's why. There is no storm that he doesn't control. When it appears the Antichrist, and the Bible says he's going to rule for three and a half years. When it appears he's in charge, he's not. God's in charge. Well, why does God let bad things happen to his people? To prove that they're his people. You know, if you don't take the mark of the beast, you can't buy, sell, or trade. What if we starve to death? Yeah, you go to heaven. What a horrible destiny. God is not interested in this life. Now, God can feed us without grocery stores. He's fed millions in the backside of a wilderness for 40 years. He has no problem getting food to us. But he also has no problem letting us go hungry. Because his goal is our salvation, not our temporal comfort. There's going to be a whole lot of churches in this Americanized Christianity, a whole lot of people that are going to backslide because they think God is just here to be their Santa Claus. He's their Burger King maker. They want it my way right away. And God is not a slave and he's not our servant. And God is not mocked whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. He's not some celestial Santa Claus in the skies that you put in your order and he makes sure it happens. When God does things, it's for his glory and for his praise. He doesn't do it just because we have a need. It's got to be something that will glorify him and bring him honor and praise. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him. And Psalm 65 identifies God three times as Elohim in verse 1, 5, and 9. And we even read brilliant flashes of messianic hope in that Psalms in verse 2, 3, and 5. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. As for, the trend, for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. He did that at Calvary who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are afar off upon the sea. In other words, when I get in a mess, if the Lord is with me, I have nothing to worry about. This is going to aggravate you because it aggravates me. It frustrates me when I'm in a tumultuous situation and I'm upside down, I'm beside myself, and I'm woe is me. And I go talk to God and he's not going to join me in my pity party. I want him to be just, just as upset about it as I am, and he's not. You ever met somebody having a pity party, and they want you to jump in and have a pity party with them? They're crying, and they're upset because you won't cry with them. You're not going to get God in a pity party. Nothing surprises God. Nothing happens, and God goes, whoo, didn't see that coming. You're not going to bring something to God and say, God, did you know? And he'll be like, oh, yeah, I knew. I let you get into that mess. The only question is, are you going to walk with me through it? Come on well, if God would just get me out of this mess, I'd live for him. No, you wouldn't. He knows better than that. He got you out of messes before, and you quit. 
I've seen God literally heal people and they walk away. I've seen God fix financial dilemmas in people's lives and they walk away. I've seen God do miracles and people walk away. Only God steals the noise of the seas and the waves. See, Satan wants terror. The Bible says in the New Testament, in nothing terrified of your adversaries. In nothing terrified of your adversaries. And nothing become afraid. Don't get, don't get beside yourself and lose your confidence. When the economy goes bust, I know the one who made the sun, the moon, and the stars. I'm not saying don't prepare as best you can. I believe God sent that, that, that famine to Egypt. But he told Joseph before he did what was going to happen. So that Joseph might prepare in the good years for the bad years. You know, Jesus told us there's going to be three and a half years before the three and a half bad years. There's Daniel's 70th week is a week of years, seven years, but only, only three and a half of it, the last three and a half. After that, you got the, the confirmation of the covenant, then you have the abomination of desolation, and then you have the battle of Armageddon. If you don't understand that, I've got a Bible study for you. Because the Lord told us what's coming before it ever gets here. He told us what to look for before it ever gets here. The Antichrist will rise among ten kings who have no kingdom. That means he's not going to rise among presidents or kings. They have a kingdom. He's going to rise among ten kings such as world bankers or, 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 or whoever, the tycoons, the ones behind the curtain that are ruling everything. The guys that don't show up on CNN and ESPN and all those places, you don't see their faces, but they're the ones ruling everything. Or they think they are ruling everything, but they're really not ruling everything. God is still ruling everything. Well, why would God let all this happen? So he can prove to the devil, you're real. You're not in this just, just to feel good or to get a headache healed or to get something you want out of it. You're in it for the long haul. You're like Job. I will not lose my integrity. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If God lets me lose my life, so be it. Somebody said, could it ever be the will of God to lose your life? Well, Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, but he was 100% man. And he prayed for the Lord to remove the cup from him. And the Lord would not. So finally he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. In other words, if you want to take my life, have at it, God. Why are you preaching this? Because a lot of false Christianity will give you the ideal that God wants you to have your best life now. If you have your best life now, you'll probably miss the real life later. But God does not want us to do this. God does not want his people to live in fear. Someone said there's 365 times the Lord said fear not in the Bible. I hadn't counted them up. But for every day there's a fear not. I know this about every time Jesus showed up somewhere and there was a problem, first thing he'd say was, fear not. Don't be afraid. Never be afraid. But Satan wants us full of terror. I'll tell you something else. The government wants you full of terror. Because terrified people are easier to control. Uh, Satan wants us full of terror and fear. He wants fear to take its, its hands and wrap around our neck and strangle the life out of us. But God comes to steal the noise of the seas and the waves. If he doesn't steal the noise of the seas and the waves, he will definitely steal the chaos inside of us. When we cross from that New Testament, Jesus still the noise of the seas and the waves in real time with those disciples because he was God in human flesh. And there are many storms that will come into our lives. You'll find terminal disease going to show up. Man, I remember the day mom pulled us in. Called a meeting for the family. Mom pulled us in. Got news. The doctor said, I've got terminal cancer. I may die. 
You know what I said? Well, Mom, heads or tails, you win. If you live, God is glorified. If you die, you're going somewhere you've been trying to get your whole life. In Christ, you can't lose. God sometimes heals. God sometimes gets more, door, more glory by us walking through. But this is what he said. I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I will not let fear overcome me. I'm not going to be conquered by fear. I'm not going to sit in the, in the corner with a, 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 my finger stuck in my mouth and say, woe is me, not woe is me, victorious is me. Amen. The bad report will come. The divorce notice will show up. The foreclosure notice will come. The termination notice will come. The chaplain will show up on the doorstep. Bad things will happen. What we've got to get is we've got to get resolved in our soul that God knew I was going to be here. And I'm going to be all right. God is going to take care of every. Thing. When devastating news comes, God will be there. We are panicked when these things happen, but Jesus is not. When the storm, when the storm was bro rolling and the disciples were in the boat, belling water, fighting for their lives, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with belling water. Do what you know to do, but at the same time, don't be afraid. They come, they find Jesus, and what's he doing? He's asleep on a pillow. They wake him up and said, Lord, don't you care that we perish? Well, of course he cares. But he's got, he's, got a, he's got a reason for the storm. Because they're going to have to learn to relax when the storms come. Calming the sea is only in God's description. No one else can calm the sea like the Lord. Everything all right? Everything okay? All right. Mickey, we forgot to plug the baptistry. You can put that on me. We're going to plug the baptistry and get it feel, it's still going, though. Thank you, brother, for taking care of that. I figured we wouldn't ignore the obvious. Amen. But God is a Sea calmer. And no one can do it but him. That's why the disciples said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Because no one can do this. And when God speaks, creation listens. Someone once said, when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens. But I'll tell you, when God speaks, everybody listens. Jesus had just set sail aboard a boat with his 12 disciples that day and it looked like it was going to be a good day for, for seafaring and going out on that Sea of Galilee. And he's got four guys I know of that are fishermen who are in those waters all the time fishing. And they know where everything is. And that, that's the strange thing about these stories. Every time you see these guys, they're, they're in familiar waters. I, I heard one time that most wrecks happen about a mile from the house. It's when we get relaxed and we think everything's okay is when bad things can occur. And these guys are in their own environment. They're inside of their own parameters. I preached a message one time about sinking in familiar waters. The apostle, when he got out of the boat, when Peter got out of that boat that day, he fished those waters. He sunk in a familiar environment. Sometimes if you're not careful, you can die on a pew. You can lose your walk with God from a church pew where you think everything's fine, but you let the fire go out in your life. And all was calm that day. It was a bright, sunny day, and a handful of the disciples were fishermen, so it looked like everything was going to be all right. I mean, we got the professionals with us, right? But there are going to be some things in your life professionals can't handle. There's nothing in your life God can't handle. But without warning that day, they spiraled from a calm cruise to rowing for their lives in a matter of minutes. 
The disciples worked their rescue mission, and but they were none the safer. They bailed and they pulled and they tried, but nothing was happening. And as soon the Bible says the boat was full of water. After all their attempts to save themselves proved futile, the disciples staggered to find Jesus somehow sleeping in the back of the boat. They woke him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And Jesus did care. He was on the boat with them, so Jesus fully appreciated the danger they perceived they were in. I want to say that again. He appreciated the danger they perceived. Everybody say perceived. You know what perception is? Perception is what you think is going to happen. Brother Jeff Arnold said one time, perception is more real than reality. You know, you can walk into a room, and all of a sudden you can start thinking, everybody in here is talking bad about me. And ain't none of them said nothing bad about you. But if you begin to perceive that, you'll begin to treat them a different way. Because your perception is greater than your reality. You can say, well, because I'm this or because I did that or because I went there or because of this relationship or because of that, I'm going to be treated badly. And that's just a perception. you got to cast down those imaginations and those things that will capture your life. And you can get into a storm and you can perceive you're going to perish. They came to Jesus and said, carest thou not that we perish. They had faith that they were going to die. And the Lord woke up. He cared. He was on the boat with them, so Jesus fully appreciated the danger they perceived they were in because he was in the same situation they were in. However, he knew something they did not understand. He knew that he could speak a word, a simple word, and the storm would obey. God used nature in the Old Testament to do his work. Many times God used nature. He rained down manna from heaven. He fed Millions of Jews for 40 years. God discomfited the Philistines with thunder during one battle. You find over and over God used nature because he controlled it. But the disciples did not understand this. And so when Jesus stepped on the bow of the boat and said, Peace, be still. And nature obeyed him. He was God. Jesus woke to the pleas of his faithless followers. He spoke to the weather, and the wind obeyed, and great calm came. And they were amazed, and they were shocked that the Lord could do such great things. You know, there's another story in the Bible. There's, there's three different stories in the Bible about the winds and the waves and Jesus and the disciples. He sends them out one time by themselves. He sends them out, Brother Meeks. The Bible says when they were in the midst of the sea at the darkest part of the night, a storm arose. But Jesus sent them there. He told them, go to the other side. They had a word from God. And he begins to walk on the water to the other side. And when they see him, the Bible says they were terrified. But you know what he said? Be not afraid. It is I. What's he walking on? Their storm. See, there's never a storm that God's not on top of. Now, now, that sounds really good until you realize there's a lot of storms we're not on top of. I'm going to meet a whole lot of stuff I can't handle, but I'm going to have to go to the one who can handle it and say, Lord, help me. And when I go to him, I'll find that he will help me. I wish I could tell you today. I wish I could tell you, and I can't. I wish I could tell you God would stop every storm, but he won't. Because sometimes storms have a purpose. Situations have a meaning that is beyond even our understanding that God is doing something. And often he's refining us or revealing himself to the world through our storms. When Jesus did this storm in this story, the Bible says they came to the other side and out came two demoniacs. This is not in your Bible, but I'm going to try to help you here, all right? They're in a storm. Jesus says, peace be still. And the storm stops, and they get to the other shore, and two demoniacs come running to the Lord, bowing down and worshiping him. This is just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to infer. Can't prove this. I'm going to infer. It's my opinion that people were on the shore 
watching the storm. They just happened to see far enough that they could see the guy on the ship raise his hands and all of a sudden, whew, peace. Like that. It wasn't like it was raining hard and it tapered off. It just whew, stopped. And that demoniac, those demoniacs looked at it and said, if he can do that, if he can do that with an external storm, what can he do with an internal storm? What are you saying? Here's what I'm trying to say. Lord, help me get this across. Here's what I'm trying to say. How you respond to your storm can help somebody else find Jesus. When the devil showed up that day and they said, Lord, Job only lives for you because of all the stuff you give him. He only lives for you because you got a hedge around his life, but because you protect him and you keep him and you, you don't let anything bad happen. God said, fine, I'll take the hedge down. How far did he lower the hedge? He lost all his kids. I can't imagine losing one. All of them in one day, Brother Meeks, gone. I'm just going to be honest with you. If I lost one, I'd be crying in the altar saying, God, what'd you let that happen for? We read it as a story, but that was a reality. That really happened. Where are you at, God? I've been there. I've prayed before and said, God, where are you? Why is this happening? And, and it's either to help me or help somebody else. One or the other, God is doing something with every storm. But so often the storm hinges on how we respond. Because when you go through a storm, people are watching you. You claim to be a Jesus name apostolic. That looks, that looks good when you got your best tuxedo on. It looks good when everything's going fine, but I want to know how you're going to behave when storm hits. The Bible says we are epistles known and read of men. That don't just mean that when everything's going good. It means when chaos happens and everything falls apart. They're watching to see what we're going to do. And that's why God uses storms. For one or two reasons. Either to purify us or to reveal himself to others. Storms are necessary. It would have been paralyzing to sit through a storm inside of a 30-foot fishing boat. I can't imagine being in a storm inside of a house on a foundation that's that bad, but to be inside of a boat and you can't control where it's going, you have no power. Inside of a 30-foot boat on the water and in the middle of the night and as the boat tossed and, and listed, the disciples thought they were as good as gone. Jesus was on board the boat. That's why it's so important to be in the church. I'll say it again. That's why it's so important to be in the church. Because the church is the boat. I don't want to come to God when everything's falling apart. That's the only time I show up. Everything's going bad, God. Now I need you. All right, God, bail me out. I'm going to hurt some feelings here. But at some point, God's going to say, you're not going to change. I've done this before. Our comfort is that Jesus is with us. He is well able to calm every storm. But even if he don't, even if he don't, he is also well able to calm every fear. And sometimes he calms one or the other. Sometimes he calms them both. But at all times, he is in control. And we can trust him in the storm because there's not going to be anything we meet today or tomorrow that he is not in control of. Jesus asked them, why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? And in Mark's gospel, the disciples had already witnessed Jesus deliver a demoniac in Capernaum and heal Peter's mother-in-law 
of a fatal of a fatal disease and touch a leper and heal him and heal and forgive a paralytic who was lowered through the roof and restore a man's withered hand in the temple. They had seen all these things. Here's the catch: happen for everybody else. Miracles are wonder when some, God does it for somebody else. It's easy to pray for somebody else's needs. But when it's you in the storm. They saw these things and yet they feared. While they were all that Jesus could heal others, they were not sure if he cared about them. But when they got to him, they said, Lord, carest thou not that we perish? You've helped everybody else up. What about us? But Jesus was on the boat. He walks to the bow and he says, Peace, be still. They still don't understand who he was. The Bible says they feared exceedingly and said unto one another, here it is, what manner of man is this? See, the storm was to try to help them understand what manner of man is this, that he ain't just a man, he is God. They thought Jesus was just a man who had come to do a work for God, as many prophets had, but Jesus was more than just a prophet. He was God who had sent the prophets who had come wrapped in flesh to dwell among us and to give his life a ransom for our souls. There's a verse in that Bible that said, if he clothes the flowers, how much more will he take care of you? If he knows every sparrow that falls, how much more will he take you? If he knows the number of hair on your head right now, why are you afraid? I don't know how this works. I know God's omnipresent, and he don't have to take account, but he knows every time my hair falls out, Brother Meeks, every time my hair falls, I'm going to go a step further. I ain't got no Bible for this. But if he counts the hair and he knows where they're at, he probably knows every time a cell falls off. So when you get into a storm, instead of saying, Lord, carest thou not that I perish? Say, Lord, I know you care for me. I know you're for me, and I know you're with me. I don't know if you'll stop the storm or stay with me in the storm, but this I do know, God, you control the storm. Amen. Pastor, can't you just throw some oil on my head and get this over? I can throw some oil on your head and we can pray. I can believe with you there's nothing impossible with God. God can do all things. But there is an unseen realm that we can't see. And that's the realm where God has got to work something in us or through us. Either for us or for somebody else. There might be some demoniac somewhere in our life that God needs us to go through a storm. So they can see who he is. Hope we're making sense today. That Galilee storm, how quickly our faith can be shaken, going from seeing dynamic miracles. It's amazing to me the children of Israel walk through the Red Sea. They walk through, never has happened. They, they got the first aquarium of the world. They got fish on both sides and dry dirt under their feet. And they walk across the Red Sea. They get over into the next land. And within one week, they get to the Jordan. Twelve spies go over to spy out the land. And they come back and say, we can't take it. What they forgot was, God's not asking you to take it. He's asking you to march in and believe him to go before you. What do you mean, preacher? Here's what I mean. God is asking you not to be afraid. It's bigger than you. God wants it to be bigger than you. So that when it comes down, you can't say, I did it. You can say, look what the Lord has done. It's stronger than you. It's got big walls. They say, they say the city of Jericho, 
that God took down. They say they've done chariot races on top of the walls. It was so big. And here's how God told them to take the city. I want you to march around the city one time for six days. In the seventh day, march around seven times. And you know what Joshua told them before they marched? He said, y'all keep your mouth shut. That's in your Bible. He said, keep your mouth shut. Here's why. Because us humans tend to see the negative side of everything. We tend to question everything. But if you let that come out of your mouth, it goes into your ears and it affects your psyche. He said, just march and don't talk. He said, matter of fact, don't say a thing until I give you the word to shout. There's another side of this too. If we don't learn how to walk, our shout won't do any good. And don't be afraid. Now, if I'm going to go to war, and that's God's plan for victory, it doesn't make any sense to us. That's probably why Joshua said, let's don't discuss it. I don't have time to talk to you right now. we got some marching to do. Yeah, but we, we really, Joshua, we need to get together. This is not how everybody else does it. It don't matter how everybody else does it. Everybody else ain't got God. And the seventh time around, they shouted. He said, shout for the Lord has given you the city. And the walls came down flat. The main thing was, don't be afraid. Don't try to figure it out. Just keep doing what God tells you to do. Here, here, when you don't know what to do, always do what you know to do. You know you ought to be at church. You do. You know God built the church. Yeah, but there's fake churches. There's fake preachers. There's fake singers. There's fake music. Oh, by the way, there's fake money. So if you don't want anything fake, we'll be glad to take all your money. Wouldn't want you to be a hypocrite. We know what to do. We just got to discipline our flesh, our flesh to do it. So when it comes time to shout for the Lord to give us victory, we got to walk behind us. It proves we ain't just blowing hot air. This this saint passed on now, but years ago when I was a young man, somewhere between here and China, there was a saint of God who came to church every once in a blue moon. But it seemed like to my young mind, every time she came to church, she shouted. Every time. I mean, she'd make the biggest, loudest scene. It didn't matter if she sat on the front row or the back, or she came every once in a while, and she'd just shout and hoop and holler and scream. But she didn't have a walk. See, God's not interested in your shout. If he can't get you just to walk. You got to keep that walk with God. That's what makes the difference to God. What manner of manner is this? I need to close. Once the boat hit the beach, we know the story. The two demoniacs came and God revealed himself to this. Let's stand. Maybe I've helped somebody today. I want to close with this. The storm reveals your character and your commitment. Storms keep us humble. Storms remind us we need God. In other words, storms help us. And finally, the storm can reveal to others your God.